everybody. I'm Kim Khan of Tabor, the editorial director um, of the Athens Democracy Forum and the foundation. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank... <laughs> Sorry about that. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Uh, Alexander and Liz for that such powerful images and testimony. I think we were all um, shivering uh, during his testimony. So very thankful to him for that. Uh, now we're going to shift gears slightly uh, to the first of our tutorials, Tools of, Tools of Democracy tutorials, uh, where we will talk about the practices, uh, advice, recommendations for the different ways we can renew democracy. And for this, I'm pleased to welcome Karsten Berg. He's a political scientist and a fellow at the Berggruen Institute. He'll give the first of these sessions. Thank you, Karsten. Can you hear me well? I know it's a big room it is, with it's some really echo chambers here. You hear me well? Over the last several years yeah. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. We've seen our democracies are under stress. They are under attack by um, autocracies, by brutal dictators. I'm still very touched, I must say, from the previous presentation from Alexander. And at the same time, our democracies are also under stress internally. Um, We've seen this from the uh, reports yesterday. Uh, there's a increased distrust in the institutions due to or revealed by the increased abstention in elections, for example, the decrease in party membership, the increase in voter volatility, citizens change their preferences, and they don't see it, they don't see themselves represented anymore sufficiently, at least, with political parties. And we're also very worried, I think, all how much contempt we often see towards politicians, even so when they fully commit and try to give their best. On the other hand, and that's a paradox, citizens want to participate, and uh, mm -hmm. perhaps this is also a big opportunity I would like to go into a little bit how we could make, maybe make this possible jointly together. And this distrust between citizens and institutions is not only vert vertical, but also from citizens to citizens horizontally, which I think is equally worrying that so many people don't trust their fellow citizens anymore or don't even meet anymore because we are so divided due to social media echo chambers. And um, I think even in this room, we are a little bit of a bubble, filter bubble, which is legitimate, of course, but for a society as a whole, when they don't meet anymore together, this endangers cohesion and the fundamental base for collective democratic decisions. And here, I think we also all agree on, we have heard this yesterday and today from Claudia brilliantly, the new democratic innovation that comes into the game are deliberative uh, democratic instruments, such as randomly stratified, randomly selected citizens' assemblies, which has been endorsed already at this place. Some of you might remember when Kofi Annan was still with us and David from Raybrook was here as one of the most important democratic innovations because they are in my view, the most inclusive democratic innovation. They include all citizens from all different strata, rich and poor, well-educated and less educated, people from all walks of life, as we always used to say in the European Union, which is my background, where we now experiment also with these kind of randomly selected citizen assemblies. Another important principle is, of course, the principle of impartiality. This gives us trust in the process because we know there's no, yeah, manipulation, whatever kind of. And it is representative, as I just said already, in the term of not electoral representative, but descriptively. So our society is being, 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 yeah, really included in the best form. I just had the opportunity to moderate one of these sessions. Uh, Germany's, this was Germany's first randomly selected citizen assembly organized by the German parliament on Germany's role in the world, a very broad topic. But I could really experience by moderating this so-called transformative deliberative act, as we call it in academia sometimes. That means citizens came into the room like here, they didn't have any clue on the topic, and they were actually given so much responsibility to provide a recommendation to solve a big problem. And in the end, due to the facilitation and the perfect circumstances with sufficient with sufficient time for learning, exchanging perspectives, listening to each other, 
they actually could produce recommendations that were really taken seriously by politicians and possibly have an impact. This is really something enlightening. I can only recommend any one of you to perhaps also go, of course, go through. Of course, we, are, we cannot choose ourselves to be randomly selected. Uh, this is part of the legitimacy enhancing mechanism, right? But um, there are a number of ways how we can contribute to make this culture change in terms of deliberate democracy, as Claudia has been in visiting this this morning. We can all contribute to make this possible. Of course, where it's light, there's also some uh, shadow always. That's part of the game in any theory and practice of democracy. And in that sense, what I am missing often when I observe and compare, I'm doing this already for quite a while, we unfortunately often observe that these recommendations are not necessarily taken up by politicians and unfortunately often are also simply ignored and, uh, or cherry-picked. Yeah? And this can then boomerang and yeah, decrease the legitimacy effect, of course, and uh, cannot prove to become the democratic innovation as it is being announced. So we, in my view, need to look into the combination and so-called embeddedness in the larger political system, how we include randomly selected citizens' uh, assemblies. And one way to do that, as I would propose, is to really look at direct democratic tools, direct democratic tools in the terms of binding citizens-initiated uh, votes, really have a big impact, as we, as we all know. Unfortunately, these instruments often are not as deliberative, and they have often a traumatizing effect on politicians on the ground, but also citizens. Not always. Uh, and uh, random, and random citizens' uh, assemblies, of course, have a very strong deliberative effect. So I suggest to really find the best of both out of these two worlds and uh, combining them, possibly. And one of the most uh, fantastic examples we've been witnessing and observing is the so-called Irish Citizens' Assembly which has been endorsed by the Irish government to really work on very difficult questions such as abortion uh, and same-sex marriage, where the government was simply overwhelmed to find or and struck, couldn't, couldn't find a solution. And then they tasked a citizen assembly to really develop over several months proposals. And um, these proposals were not just implemented by the government, but they were given to the entire Irish citizenry, and they actually accepted the topic that has been nearly been a mission possible to agree on for many, many years. So this, I believe, is a very beautiful example where it shows that citizens' assemblies randomly selected can help decision makers to take very difficult and hard decisions and at the same time build public trust. The trust topic is, for me, the compass. And uh, in that sense, the decision makers were not only the traditional executives on the top, but also we as citizens on the bottom. I don't like these hierarchy pictures, but we are used to working this, right? Uh, so it is both decision makers on, on the government side and the citizens really. Um, of course, we also, as I said, um, face the same problem at all different levels of politics. And at transnational level, Ursula von der Leyen, who speaks tonight, will probably report on that. We've been running the conference on the future of Europe exactly in a very similar style as, as in many other citizens' assemblies. And uh, the random citizens have actually proposed to permanently institutionalize randomly selected citizens' assemblies at, at transnational level. We at the UI in Florence were, um, were lucky enough to host these citizens' assemblies when it was about these topics. Uh, this, this year and last year. And uh, now the big question is also here, how do we combine possibly randomly selected citizens' assemblies um, with the broader political system? And especially at European level, where there's such a distance between citizens and institutions, I believe this is so necessary to, to, to look in the nitty gritty. And um, what we have at the European level in terms of the direct citizens' participation at least, is the so-called European Citizens Initiative, right? Uh, I had already the pleasure 20 years ago in the Constitution Convention to contribute to include this, where one million citizens can require, request and invite the Commission to come up with legislation. So this could be one option, actually, to, to really combine the um, citizen assemblies uh, and, the, and, and the larger 
field, so to say, in order to reach out to the wider public. Of course, a citizen's initiative is not a citizen's initiated referendum, and um, we must differentiate between the different forms. I think yesterday morning, many things were mixed up. Uh, but uh, this, this in general, I believe, would be, would be right, very important way. Of course, we don't have a European demos in the sense of one single European democracy, but we are a plurality of democracies. And this is particularly challenging um, when we now develop the design for a citizen assembly at, at uh, transnational levels. So what we had in the conference, I think that was a wise and really smart idea to have first or in parallel national citizen assemblies on the future of Europe and European transnational citizen assemblies. You see it's getting complex, but that's part of God, globalized politics, I believe. And uh, then they were merging, and we had a session together with representatives of all 27 governments, parliament, commission, and the random citizens to agree on these kind of proposals. Of course, the digital dimension is here absolutely key. We have the translation challenge. Uh, we have the huge geographic distances and online communication with uh, random citizens, but also with direct democracy is brilliantly um, yeah, overbridged in so far as online communication is simply rapid, has a huge w reach out, and it is scalable, so it is extremely cheap compared to paper and classical communication. This is trivial, but we really must implement that, yeah? and for that, we need to develop further tools. I'm a deliberative democ de democracy theorist and activist, so I would keep I would like to keep it short. I will not exhaust my 15 minutes, but rather like to invite you to possibly ask questions and uh, to go into the debate. I know it's very little time anyway, but it would be wonderful perhaps to, to get into exchange. Also feel free to come to me afterwards. Thank you so much for listening.